very, very warm welcome back to the Lizelle Wellbeing Show. I'm Lizelle and I'm enjoying speaking with leading experts and familiar faces from the world of well-being to bring you wellness wisdom you can trust. Now, long-time listeners will know that I have developed a passion for all things estrogen ever since I first sat down to write my book, The Good Menopause Guide, back in 2018. And while researching the book, I learned just how much, as women, we depend on this hormone for our health and vitality, and how supplementing levels with safe, audio-identical, regulated HRT during the perimenopause and beyond can improve both our length and quality of life. An area that I haven't yet covered in detail on the podcast, however, is the effects that oestrogen has on the skin. And that's why I'm so pleased to share with you the conversation I've just had with Dr. Rebecca Booth, the obstetrician and gynecologist with 30 years practice under her belt. Alongside her successful medical practice in Louisville in the United States, Rebecca has somehow found the time to launch a -a one-of-a-kind skincare line with a beauty industry veteran sister, Cecil. It's called Venefect, and her products are packed with phytoestrogens, that's estrogen derived from plants, to enhance our skin's quality, glow, and elasticity. We had a fascinating chat about the effects of estrogen on our skin, especially in terms of delaying the signs of aging. And do stay tuned to the end of the podcast as Rebecca and her team have put together a very special offer to share with us all. I am so looking forward to hearing your thoughts about all of this and more on Instagram after the show. And don't forget, if you would like to watch our chat, you can now find our full video podcasts over on the Lizelle Wellbeing YouTube channel as well for those that we were able to film in vision. So without further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. So Rebecca, I am so thrilled that we have been able to set this up transatlantically because you and I first connected, I think, just on a call, maybe was it a year or so ago? That's right. It's been almost a year, November. And you were due to come to the UK and of course that had to be cancelled. It did. We were so disappointed and we canceled somewhat early, we thought. Now, looking back, it was very appropriate because we might have been stuck in the UK, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but my patients would be upset. Yeah, I'm sure they would. (laughs) So where are you talking to us from? Give us an idea of where you're based and what your surroundings look like. So I'm actually in Louisville, Kentucky, home of the Kentucky Derby, which just ran in September instead of the first Saturday in May this year. And that's where my practice is. And Mm -hmm. then our skincare business that I have with my sister, Cecil, is based in Chicago, where she is. Right. So you're sort of almost not quite opposite ends of the States, but you're not close, are you? Well, she's really defined as the Midwest. And Kentucky was a neutral state in the uh, the Civil War. So we're sort of, we could be defined either way, but we, we consider ourselves Southern. Yeah. Excellent. Now let's go back because you are a practicing doctor specializing in women's health. So where did all that come from? What was your journey? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I love to tell because when I um, applied to medical school in 1980, it, women, it was still very unusual for women, but my year uh, was pivotal. It was the highest percentage of women accepted to University of Louisville Medical School. And we actually had 40, and it was a critical mass at that time. Uh, the schools were having to make changes and have changing rooms for women, and the hospitals were trying to do the same thing. So um, I was actually amazed during medical school. I did not want to do OBGYN because I knew it was demanding and I wanted to have a family someday. So o- o- OBGYN, that's obstetrics and gynecology. Yeah, that's correct. I'm just just the, just just uh, translating the jargon. OBGYN. <laughs> that's, that's good. Right. But the training program was dominantly men and so was the science. Is that extraordinary medicine- for, for female health care? Exactly. And medicine's been, you know, for years taught by men to men. So when I realized that there were so many questions I had that couldn't be answered based on the lack of experience, direct experience, I felt myself just drawn to the field. And then when I finished training, there was an opportunity to start an all-female practice, which was almost unheard of at the time. 
Yeah. So in 1989, four of us as women started what we call, what what's now called Women First, and we now have 25 uh, caregivers, 11 of whom are physicians, all female, and about 95 employees, and see 350 uh, women a day as patients through our practice. Gosh, so um, all aspects of women's health. That's exactly right. Obstetrics, gynecology, and fertility, fertility optimization, menopausal management, PMS treatment, all of that. Yes. And prevention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And did you come from a medical family? Was that your your background? Well, uh, my father and Cecil, my father was a physician and he did do obstetrics, even though he was a family physician. So, yes, but uh, he was very opposed uh, to women in medicine, thinking it was too demanding if they wanted a family. So but he passed away when I was in my 20s. And I I like to think the way we in my practice shared responsibilities with call and whatnot. All of us has have um, had children. In fact, I delivered about 14 of the 17 children we had in the first seven years of practice uh, just amongst the partners. Uh, no greater teacher than experiencing delivering your own OBGYN partner. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is that is really quite hardcore, isn't it? And of course, now you are in business, as you mentioned, with the skincare line, which we'll talk about because it's so fascinating with your sister. So how did that come about? How, how did you decide to create a brand working with your sibling? Well, again, it, it's very organic, a conversation between women. And my sister was experiencing some changes after her delivery, her second child. She had it 40. And she was asking me questions that are super common questions about her body and her her notice, her notice, aesthetic changes that she noticed at 40 delivering that she didn't notice when she had had her first child in her 30s. So I explained to her about what I call the ovarian retirement plan. And (laughs) essentially, it's the same thing as the biological clock. We just, we don't um, really speak in terms of menopause and the biological clock being essentially um, the same phenomenon, but it's it's the way that women age differently from men. And, And again, because medicine's an apprenticeship in general, that that experience um, that we share as women has been somewhat left out of the medical um, training and ways to communicate it, such as using terminology like the ovarian retirement plan are just not there. So when I explained to her that at 40, her hormonal baseline is quite a bit lower than it was in her 30s when she went from a very high hormonal state during pregnancy to a postpartum state that was quite lower her uh, skin changes and her hair changes and metabolic changes and mood changes were more dramatic. Mm. And she w- she was just so caught off guard by that information that yeah. we decided to, um, yeah, to go forward with a platform to help educate women as well as to help assist in that in that challenge. That's so interesting, isn't it? I had long been aware that there is this disparity in medicine and it's very heavily male biased. And even in the UK, we're finding that that so much about menopause and hormone health is simply not being taught in medical school. Even now, you know, despite half the population being women and half the patients that a general practitioner doctor here will see being female. But it never really occurred to me that actually it's because, it, as you say, medicine was so often taught by men to men. So therefore, where were the female voices? Where were the, the, the women saying, well, actually, in my experience, you know, when I got to the age of 45 or 50, this is what I felt. And therefore, this is what we need to be addressing as physicians. Well, you're absolutely right. And it's it's really starting to hit critical mass. But again, I've been in practice 31 years and in training eight years before that. So at that time, the voices were were not being heard. But The other challenge that's important to talk about, because you are so exquisitely focused on wellness, Liz, is that medicine in general was founded on illness. Right. Yeah. And the (laughs) ovarian retirement plan is not a disease, yet it affects every system Mm. in a woman's body and every relationship that she has professionally, romantically, and even with her children, et cetera. Yeah. because we are now living for the first time in world history, more years on average without ovarian function than with ovarian function, it's critical 
for, for healthcare workers and women to understand what that means for optimizing wellness. That's so fascinating. So let's go back a step. When you talk about ovarian function, what are you talking about? Are you talking about levels of estrogen circulating? Well, certainly, horm uh, reproductive hormones circulating and what that means for mind, body, spirit, and as well as, again, health. And as well as vitality, specifically with regard to what we expect from sexuality and, of course, our aesthetic. Mm. And I, I think as we are awakening more um, post um, Charles Darwin, another great Brit, that uh, discovery with evolution, there's more of an understanding about the directive towards natural selection and how that controls our, our behavior. So much of the popular literature recently has been written by anthropologists and evolutionary psychologists. But what's fascinating to me is what's often missing is the intricacies of reproductive hormones as it relates to women. Mm. Because again, not to downplay it too much, but men are sort of one hormone wonders, let's say. <laughs> yeah, so not, not, not quite a one trick pony, but not far off. <laughs> Right, not far <laughs> off, and, and bless our hearts, they're the first to admit it often, but if they're not even cyclic, and then they don't have, mm. um, let's just say, testicular retirement plan, right. then how, how can they really understand the manipulation of the intricacies of the cycle? So you asked, what am I spe speaking of specifically? Mm. So of course, estrogen, but also testosterone and progesterone. But in addition to that, the cyclic phenomenon and how that manipulates our behavior as well as our aesthetic. Mm. And then, of course, the biological clock. So the biological clock, again, is, the, is my name for the ovarian retirement plan. But it also affects, if you will, the biological clock of our aesthetic, the biological clock of our mood, our yes. skin, our sexuality. I'm not saying we have to yield to it, mm. but you can't negotiate with it if you don't understand it. Oh my goodness. I love that expression. We can't negotiate with it unless we understand it. So to that end, what is the, the, the situation like a, across the waters with you in the States? Because here in the UK, menopause is just beginning to be talked about. You know, the, I wrote my first book on it, published four years ago, and, and the, that felt quite brave because nobody was really writing about it and sticking their head above the parapet. It was uh, almost like the last taboo. What's what's the mood like where you are? Well, let me commend you because you are brave and I have your book right here on my bookshelf. Oh, thank and you. I, and I'm, I'm a, it's one of your many books. <laughs> and I'm so impressed that you did stick your neck out. And I have to say, I often say when I speak to physicians, there is a thin line between brave and foolish. And if you're not willing to be a little bit foolish, then you're mm. not really brave. Right. So, yes, yeah. I'm still sticking my neck out here. But I, my favorite audience I will share with you are physicians because they're hungry for metaphors to help their patients. And not just the women, but the mm. men who love them as Absolutely. well as some. Yeah. yeah as phenomenon in men. So yes, America has vilified estrogen because it's confusing. Mm. And that vilification goes back to almost a metaphor with Eve and the apple in the Garden of Eden. It's so it's so universal. Yeah. So yes, the states is still behind. But those of us and, and you are united in this, who are determined to stand on education, that's the only way delivering the understanding that we can help um, optimize the chance to, to negotiate, as I said earlier, with these yeah. uh, phenomenon uh, for women. And the misinterpreted data dating back to the Women's Health Initiative uh, 18 or so years ago, is that being widely acknowledged now in the States or are you still having to live with that legacy? We're living with the legacy, despite Joanne Manson, who was the um, premier woman woman behind investigator behind the study. The cardiologists were so delighted to be able to say they didn't have to prescribe estrogen for heart disease that the true messages got muddled and lost. So we're catching yeah. up. 
to your point, but this, the fear factor has not been eliminated Mm -hmm. and we're working on that. Metaphors will help. So going back to your question, when Cecil, my sister said, you know, what's going on? What I explained to her is there's almost, um, a, a magical metaphor with the goddess Venus that mother nature creates a certain recipe, if you will, for optimizing feminine vitality that corresponds with the fertile window in a woman's cycle. Mm-hmm. The metaphor we use for that is the Venus week. The so Venus that's- week. Yes. Okay. So do, yeah. do all women in their cycle have a Venus week? That's absolutely correct. And the Venus week if you will, is the grouping of days that occurs before she ovulates. So we all pay attention to that week before we have our period. Mm. Everyone pays attention to, oh, PMS, bad moods. Here we go vilifying our hormones when actually right before our period is when our hormones are at their lowest, not their highest. The Venus so that's week, why we feel bad, because they're low, not because they're raging and surging, as, as, as we're told. You're absolutely right. But uh, not only that, but because we're manipulated a little bit. And again, not to be cruel to Mother Nature, I always say it may seem unfair, but it's very strategic. She designs us to be on duty, off duty, on duty, off duty. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And even further, on duty, possibly pregnant, off duty. Right. Yeah. Even if, a, if, even if a woman's never met a man, the progesterone dominant part of her cycle is controlled by the assumption that she might be pregnant. So the metaphor I use for that stage is the Minerva phase, um, the goddess of wisdom, which by the way, she was a virgin. So we have, we have, yeah, we almost have a flirty phase and a jesting phase and then PMS phase. But if you don't understand the recipe behind them, you can't negotiate with it. So yeah. So the Venus week was the metaphor. And that was our first product, if you will, was a book. Yeah. That I published called the Venus week to launch the concept, to give women that recipe behind their vitality. So really understanding this cycle and the change in hormones and how it affects mood and skin and sexuality and just so many things. And how does that then translate during menopause? Because then obviously we're not ovulating. Do we still have a Venus week? Well, what we have is a canvas to paint our own design. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the hormones are strategic. They manipulate us. Now, I'm not, again, saying that they're bad because under, they're, they're lovely. We wouldn't even be women and men wouldn't be men mm-hmm. without hormones. Mm-hmm. But but they are strategic based on natural selection. So once a woman's ovaries have fully retired, that gives her the opportunity to take charge and have her own directive. But she can't do that if she doesn't understand how to negotiate with that design. Mm-hmm. It There is an accelerated hormonal aging process that takes place with the biological clock of the ovaries. It, it's, it's again, analogous to the aging of the eggs. Mm-hmm. We're very familiar with that because we're fearful for our 30 something woman who wants to conceive at some point. So we know that hormonal aging is, is a process, but we don't often discuss, but how does that affect bone density, skin, sexuality? Because it's, as you say, still somewhat in the closet. Mm. So how did you move then from mainstream medicine more into the beauty industry? Was it this wanting to to focus more on hormones and, and reflect that within hormonal skincare, which which seems such a new thing? Absolutely. And in, in writing the book, What we found was that there were strategies dietarily, there were strategies mood-wise, there are even strategies that we borrow from the plant world to offset hot flashes that have been known for centuries Mm. by women, sort of whispered down, if you will, through medicine, men and women, and, um, and even physicians knowing that certain plants can help offset 
uh, symptoms such as hot flashes. In fact, the discovery of the birth control pill was made from plants yes. that can mimic, yes, that can mimic estrogens. So th- we knew that these th- substances were available, but we could not find a solution for skin. Mm-hmm. And because Cecil's background was in the beauty industry, we put our talents together to focus on skin, using that as a great metaphor and ultimately a goal to help educate and lift a woman's ability to negotiate with the biological clock of her aesthetic. Because your whole range is is called Ven effect, which is Venus effect. Is that right? That's so right. Yes, because we don't just want a Venus week. Right. To your point, <laughs> we want a Venus life, please. We want a ve- the Venus effect. Yeah. And that's what we want to do is extend that that recipe, if you will, by understanding and negotiating throughout a woman's lifetime. Mm-hmm. And now we know that the influence of hormones on our skin is huge. And it, they're influencing everything, aren't they? From how our skin glows, hormonal breakouts, elasticity, Why are hormones so important when it comes to how our skin looks? Well, hormones are so important for our aesthetic. Um, You know, we take for granted, I I always say Botticelli somehow knew every single uh, aspect of the estrogen receptor on a female body because the painting of the Venus, the Botticelli shows a woman with glowing skin, long hair, a beautiful waist to hip ratio, in fact, a perfect waist to hip ratio, all of these reflect the effects of estrogen that are um, scientifically manipulated through the estrogen receptor throughout a woman's body to reflect, okay, this is the feminine aesthetic at peak fertility. This is a symbol of where the warrior coming home on leave needs to go to impregnate. Isn't that Again. amazing? So our estrogen levels are controlling our waist to hip ratio. They're giving us a, a, a smaller waist. Is that right? That's exactly right. In fact, even before puberty, you know, we think of our young girl as being sort of a, a straight stick, right? Our skinny prepubertal young woman. Yeah. And then but the curve, the curve that's so attractive, the, even Coca-Cola borrowed from that curve, right. that's estrogen facilitated. And when it's withdrawn, as a woman enters her 30s and 40s, and then more dramatically in menopause, it doesn't just affect her aesthetic, but her health, because we we know so well that the pear shape is healthier than the apple shape right yes yes so laying down fat particularly on the stomach the abdomen and creating that sort of barrel shape we know is linked to a much higher rate of heart disease for example and that's one of the reasons i guess why hrt estrogen can help combat that You absolutely hit on it. And that was another message lost during the Women's Health Initiative and the fear factor on estrogen is that hormone therapy, women who opt to take it, have less type 2 diabetes. Ultimately, again, less fat around the waist. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a miracle, but it is significant because it relates back to overall health and even cognitive health. Yes. Type 2 diabetes is a huge risk factor for cognitive decline. And type 2 diabetes goes up dramatically in women with menopause. That's so interesting. And of course, we're hearing a lot about that over in the UK at the moment with the, the effects of COVID and the comorbidities and the risk factors. And there are very interesting early studies going on looking at women on HRT who are replacing their estrogen, who seem to be less at risk of ending up in intensive care units or even dying of COVID. And, you know, it probably doesn't receive enough attention, but if if one carefully traces it back, it may be related to truncal obesity or fat around the tummy, as we were talking about, Mm. because it's so difficult when a woman's ovaries retire without hormone replacement, but it can be done. You know, we need to know and be aware that many women are not candidates for HRT Mm. or hormone replacement therapy. And further, in in the States, most women opt not to take it um, because of concerns about risks. So how 
What are the secrets to help us negotiate to keep that type 2 diabetes down and the truncal fat in yes. addition to keeping our aesthetic? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, that's a whole a whole big conversation. I think, you know, with growing awareness and understanding of, of the risks and non-risks, that will hopefully be overcome in time. But I think what's also very interesting, and this is kind of moving on, if you like, from the internal use of replacing estrogen through HRT, is actually looking at the estrogen receptors within the skin and looking at how topical estrogen might have an influence and play a part. Well, and it's such a great question because as a gynecologist, we know and we've known for decades the topical estrogen on sexual skin in a woman who's postpartum, in a very young infant girl who's who's perhaps having problems with her labia and the vaginal area, and certainly in our menopausal women with recurrent urinary tract infections, painful intercourse, or just dryness, mm. the topical estrogen works wonders. In fact, there are so many estrogen receptors in the skin, in the epidermis, in sexual skin, that it only takes takes a tiny amount to see a dramatic improvement within days um, on wow. sexual skin. Yes. Mm. And then that, again, is the epidermis. But what's lesser known is that the second highest place for estrogen receptors in skin on a woman's body is her face. No way. I didn't know that. Yes. Isn't that so amazing? So presumably the primary site is the vagina and pelvis, that's, pel that's pel right. pelvic area. That's uh, correct. And then the second highest area is the face. You know, again, let's not underestimate the power of the aesthetic, the mm -hmm. way that Mother Nature directs behavior. We look at each other's face to sort of see, are we attracted to that person? And Mother Nature, while she understands that love and beauty are higher powers, attractiveness often relates the natural selective process, which of course is breeding. Oh so, my goodness, so are you saying that we've got estrogen receptors on our face so that when the warriors return home from battle, they can be instinctively drawn or attracted to the most fertile women in their communities? You know, we know it, don't we? We know it. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't we... realize it was there in our biology. I mean, that's just mad. <laughs> I mean, it's not mad. It's very sensible, but it's it's crazy to even think about that, really. Well, again, we gynecologists are in an advantage because we can see the, the highest concentration, right, of estrogen receptors first. That's where we sit, literally, right. in the fam room, right? <laughs> And, and so, and I, I just was having this conversation yesterday with a patient of mine because she said, you know, do you want to test my hormone? She was younger and she skipping her periods and worried that she might be going through menopause. And and I'm saying, you know, I can tell, I can see that your your estrogen is is perfect because your sexual skin looks lovely. It's full. It's it's um, it's got you've got good collagen, elastin. So I know that your ovaries have not retired. And and. I don't have to even stick a needle in to draw blood levels. That It's mm. obvious. But the estrogen receptors on the face, again, the highest area in the skin on the body, higher than the skin on the breast. Really? Um, it's more subtle. But any woman who's, whose aesthetic is manipulated through her hormone cycle mm. knows that there are effects. You know, her skin is great during her Venus week right after her period. Her skin is not so good right before her period. We all know it. Mm. We just don't understand why. And now yeah. you know. <laughs> so can we use estrogen topically on the skin? Absolutely. And again, gynecologists have known it for, for decades. What most doctors and even dermatologists don't know is that in the epidermis in the face, there are loads of receptors. In fact, there are estrogen receptors in the skin all over the body, but it's high, the highest concentration is sexual skin and second, the face. Third is the breast and fourth, the thigh. Mm. So or in reverse, they're very close. And that that science was actually worked out by a, um, an investigator decades ago that I thought, and here's my sexual bias, I thought was, I just assumed was a man. And of course, I realized later in 1980, I should have known it was a woman investigator that discovered that the second highest uh, area for um, estrogen receptors is the face. Mm. So yes, they are effective topically. So and could, could I take my estrogen gel then instead of rubbing it on my thighs? Could I rub it on my face instead? Well, you could, but here's the here's the interesting thing. Your gel is formulated to go through the skin. Yes. Not on the skin. Right? Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. 
So there may be a slight effect topically on, on the skin, but the alcohol that's in the gel to help mm. it penetrate is a little drying for skin. Yes. So true. it, so it has to be specially formulated to get that epidermis. And that's why we don't use estrogen gel for sexual dryness. We use a different product for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course you do. Yes, you have a cream or, you know, a pessary or something like that. So you yeah. created uh, the, the Ven Effect range. Is that really using topical estrogens in, in formulations that are stable on the skin? Is that the kind of the bottom line, really? Well, what we use is we borrow from nature the solution to the ovarian retirement plan, which are plant estrogens. Again, mm -hmm. the discovery of the birth control pill was actually made through observation and observations in farm animals that certain plants mimic estrogen. Now, don't kid don't kid yourself. It was known by humans for years. But centuries ago, certain plants were used to contracept. In fact, if you ever read the, um, there are certain books that, that are historical fiction. And one of my favorites is The Red Tent. And in that, they talk about ancient women in the tribe of Jacob using fennel seeds to, to contracept. So really? there are, yes. Gosh, there so, are, so in, ingesting fennel seeds, they're high in estrogen, are they? They could be used as yes. an early form of contraceptive pill. Yes, yes. How fascinating. Book they used, and there was a certain fennel that was farmed out of extinct or into extinction because it was so popular for birth control, Gosh. and that that was uh, related to the fennel plant that was used. So we know, for example, that soybeans have some estrogenic effect. Mm -hmm. um, we know that grape seeds, um, sort of the secret of resveratrol, is the reproductive vitality that's good for the heart because resveratrol is one of the most potent phytoestrogens on the planet. I had no idea that was the case. That's amazing. So does that mean that our glass of red wine in the evening is actually doing us some good there as well? Absolutely. But the only problem is it can cause a little bit of flushing, okay. which can <laughs> make the hot flash worse. <laughs> But, uh, uh, fo component. foiled again but of course when yeah. we, I mean we look at body identical or bioidentical regulated HRT in in the UK not the unregulated compounded kind but the regulated kind that you get from your, your doctor here and that of course is based on the wild yam plant that produces natural estrogen which is identical to the stuff that we have in our body well it's it's actually synthetically manipulated to mm. be identical so we don't have, there is no plant that has absolutely identical estrogen, testosterone or progesterone, mm. but there are, but there are molecules that are quite similar. In fact, the definition of a phyto or phytoestrogen is a molecule from a plant that acts on the estrogen receptor. Mm -hmm. So if it's defined as a phytoestrogen, then you know the science has always already been worked out that mm -hmm. it does activate the estrogen receptor. So what does that mean? Well, the estrogen receptor, when it's activated, literally inspires the machinery of the cell on which it sits to sort of do act like a estrogen mimic. In other words, for skin, the cell begins to make more elements of collagen, hyaluronic acid, and elastin, an incredibly estrogen-inspired uh, molecule. Mm -hmm. Sort of obvious why Mother Nature wants elastin to be made by estrogen because a woman's body has to change so much with regard to elasticity during pregnancy. Right. Yeah, oh, it's so all so fascinating, isn't it? When you look at your products, you know, it's very interesting to talk about this in theory, but what trials have you done with them and, and what results have you seen? Well, uh, there have been many trials that were already done, fortunately for us, before we started with regard to topical estrogen's effects on skin. And mm -hmm. so, again, investigators have sort of known for decades that these molecules are effective um, uh, with regard to stimulating estrogen receptors on skin. So what we did was once we formulated with high potency our collection of phytoestrogens, was use, was use volunteers from our community and my practice. And believe me, I didn't have any trouble recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a long now, line. <laughs> yeah, to have um, to have some of my employees and my patients use these products in order to determine, okay, is it going to help improve the glow of their skin? Do they see themselves and can they judge 
that they see um, significant improvement over six weeks? And how is it at two weeks compared to six weeks mm-hmm. and whatnot? And and the study was is, was absolutely positive. Mm-hmm. And that gave us the confidence, but it again was already based on science that's well-documented and has been for decades that phytoestrogens are effective. In fact, the, the industry knew this. Some, some years ago, there was a launch of products that used um, in this case, soy derivatives to help reduce the interval of shaving legs. Really? You may remember that. Yeah, and I, state- I do. I do have some vague memory of products that were supposed to reduce hair growth. Yeah. Yes. And so it's, again, interesting, isn't it? If again, Let's go back to our Botticelli lesson. So when you look at that medieval painting, somehow that woman has no body hair, you know, which is sort of interesting. But Very incredible. true. <laughs> Incredible scalp hair, right? Well, that's the effect of estrogen. Again, all we have to do is take Botticelli and project. Estrogen stimulates scalp hair, but reduces body hair. That's the feminine aesthetic, right? The opposite of testosterone, which wow. reduces for men's poor men's with and some women reduces mm-hmm. scalp hair but increases facial or body hair. So the manufacturers of certain lotions used phytoestrogens in the lotions to try to reduce the amount of um, times that a woman needed to wax or shave. And they were effective. Mm. And so, you know, again, it, it caught on, but it's subtle and it takes a lot of diligence and most women still had to shave. So it's kind of didn't go over as well. But once again, the science was known. Mm. So, Yeah. What Cecil and I wanted to do was to get higher levels of the purified molecules that are the essence of the phytoestrogen activity Mm -hmm. and then ramp up that concentration in our products in order to make a significant difference. And and that's where we put our heads together to do with Benefect. And then what age uh, are these products suitable for, presumably for more mature skin for older women? Do you have to be perimenopausal, postmenopausal? Well, the good news is that the estrogen receptor is there from birth to death. So I like to encourage my patients across their ovarian retirement plan, which, believe it or not, sort of corresponds with the fertility curve peaking at 25 to 27. So the earlier a woman starts inspiring her estrogen receptors in her epidermis and to some degree, her dermis, the better results she's going to get long term. But again, the good news is that even as I tell my 80 year old whose sexual skin is really suffering and she's having urinary tract problems, if I put topical estrogens or phytoestrogens on her skin, she'll improve because the receptors never go away. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So it's and, a and, they're, and they're super hungry, presumably, because they've been I, you know empty for so long. Yes. I mean, I used to say I could just toss it across the room and the skin would light up because you're exactly right. Those estrogen receptors are starved for those molecules. So using the products in the 20s, mid 20s on, or even starting in perimenopause, whenever a woman becomes sort of awakened to the biological clock of her skin. Mm -hmm. How does she become awakened? Usually because someone educates her and tells her hormonal aging is is unique to women in in many ways, but it it does start in uh, around the the Mm mid-20s. Estrogen is still very much a taboo, I think, over here in certain places with misplaced concerns about safety and increased risk of breast cancer. Have you had any pushback on the product since the launch relating to that? Unfortunately, again, the word estrogen has been somewhat vilified. And you and I have talked about this. We spoke about it earlier. You know, it's interesting how many chemicals and substances are still sort of getting away with murder, if you will. In the U.S., probably the one that's the most significant is sugar. And Uh, right behind it. it Literally right behind it is insulin. And I I like to say that whenever you hear estrogen blamed for something, you can pretty much bet that it's really insulin. That's 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 the problem. Insulin is a growth hormone that's inspired by carbohydrates, and it will make um, very many things grow that we don't want to grow, such as skin tags and polyps, but also cancers. And there's a lot of confusion, even with, let's say, 
PCOS, for example, often estrogen excess gets blamed for the fallout from polycystic ovarian syndrome. I'm sure that's true in the UK. Yes. What really the culprit is insulin. If a woman's ovaries are with PCOS, if her ovaries are removed, her metabolic problems get worse not better. Mm. The ovaries are actually, and a woman's estrogen are victimized by insulin. So yes, we get a lot of misunderstanding and it takes a a big, strong effort to sort of redirect that. But phytoestrogens are not vilified. They're just not understood. Mm -hmm. So if women, if, if women can keep their ears and eyes open and and receive the gift of the knowledge, then they're enlightened to, to again negotiate. Mm. Interesting, you talk about men there as well briefly. I think as men get more interested in skincare, do they also have topical estrogen receptors within their skin? Could they benefit from this as well? They certainly do. And but what they don't have is they it typically the healthy male doesn't have a cyclic phenomenon and he doesn't really have a, um, a testosterone retirement plan. But men, certain men do suffer from premature loss of their testosterone and they would benefit enormously. In fact, men who have a problem metabolizing testosterone through an enzyme known as aromatase, have problems with aggressively aging skin and bone because actually it's not the testosterone that helps their bones and skin, it's the estrogen. And it's aromatase that converts testosterone to estrogen. So men that have a rare condition where they don't convert it have poor skin quality and bone density loss. And guess what? They're higher risk for diabetes type 2. That's so fascinating. So men obviously don't have um, ovaries like we do to produce estrogen. So they produce their estrogen from their testosterone. Is that correct? Yes. And so do women. Do we? Yes. Yes, estrogen is actually manufactured from testosterone. So if a woman is put on, you may have heard of an aromatase inhibitor, many breast cancer women, yes, that will completely block her estrogen because it's made um, from testosterone. All of us, our, our estrogen is made from testosterone. It's converted to estrogen by way of an enzyme known as aromatase. So, um, you know, some anthropologists will look at that biologically and say that testosterone was sort of an afterthought. It was it's a precursor. And somehow Mother Nature decided, okay, well, we'll use this. And (laughs) and then uh, I like to say that that uh, my husband will will say that men are an upgrade because it it was the Y chromosome, you know, that was uh, delivered to convert the X into a male. But, you know, I always say, you know, if you go without an extra X, the baseline is a woman. Yes. So fascinating. I mean, you probably read Lisa Moscone's book on uh, on the aging brain and using estrogen and how that all, you know, having that extra X is so important. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I haven't read hers, but um, there is another, uh, Louise Bresendine, who wrote The Female Brain, mm. um, speaks to that same issue, especially with verbal memory and right. verbal acuity. Mm-hmm. So, so interesting. So coming back to topical application, because this is something that's that's a really new area, um, certainly for me to look at, using estrogen on the skin and, and the reasons why. Can you combine that then with other ingredients? Because we've got a lot of things going on over here in the UK. People are using a lot of retinols, um, AHAs, hyaluronic acid. Are, are these Can estrogen work alongside these other ingredients? Absolutely. And just like so many things in medicine, when we use synergistically uh, various medications to, let's say, improve even our defense against COVID, you might have heard of using antivirals and vitamin D, for example, Mm. and you mentioned estrogen earlier. But if you use a retinol, which will help increase turnover and inspire new cellular development, along with a phytoestrogen to activate the machinery of the skin cell to make more elastin, hyaluron and collagen, then you actually get an additive phenomenon. You're you're improving on the result. And, and so again, as so many processes in the body, there are multiple stimuli to help optimize vitality of the skin. Mm. Two of the things that I really like, actually, which I've tried from your range, um, one is the firming serum, the phytolift serum. So presumably that's using estrogen and other ingredients in there as well. 
That's right. We have, uh, in fact, the vehicle for the serum is an, is an oat kernel extract that lifts and literally adds sort of a natural tightening phenomenon to the face. Um, and it, it's derived, again, from the oat kernel and a polysaccharide. And then we also have other elements that will in, inspire an anti-aging effect. But the primary ingredient in our serum, because it's such a simple formula, are the phytoestrogens. Mm. And would you use that on its own or would you then, I know you've got also a really intensive moisturizer. Would you use that on the top or, or, or is that designed to be enough just as the serum? There is no oil in the serum, uh, essentially oil free. So I usually encourage using a moisturizer to sort of give what we call our luminosity duo. Mm -hmm. So um, basically the epidermis, as you mentioned earlier, sometimes those receptors for estrogen are starved for those molecules. So what the serum does is very simply and easily without oil deliver directly to the epidermis phytoestrogen molecules to inspire the, the elements of glow. So for a younger woman, she could get away without with only using the serum, without a moisturizer. But for that, that woman emerging from her mid to late 20s, let's say a 27-year-old, 28-year-old, she's going to want to trap or sandwich that effective serum with our intensive moisturizer, which also adds an, other elements to inspire, um, besides our phytoestrogens, to inspire the glow of skin, uh, such as elements that that mimic the effect of vitamin C that, that help brighten, as do phytoestrogens as well. And then a combination, a range of phytoestrogens that work together to synergistically uh, activate the estrogen receptor, including lovely elements of emolliency, uh, such as shea butter and other elements to kind of keep that hydration element entrapped over a layer of the serum. It's what we call our luminosity duo, and it's just dynamite. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. No, I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, trying it, I have to say. And presumably you can use these kinds of things all over the, the body. Do you have body products that will help put back estrogen into to dry skin that's you know not on the face? When it comes to the body, the best... Um, of our product line is our neck formulation. You see the neck is less blemish prone. So we very carefully formulated our intensive moisturizer for face to try to reduce the chances of blemish. But in our neck product, we could dial up, including um, again, shea butter, but also beeswax and other elements to inspire um, moisturization and a at a higher level and it works wonders for body. So I will take a generous amount of our neck product, apply it all over my neck and decollete, and then use the residual on my forearms and on mm. my thighs. And it's absolutely perfect. Combining a little bit also with a with a regular body moisturizer, yep. um, just one that you use for all over, will again help with those receptors, which to your point are all over our body and our epidermis everywhere. So really, you know, that's very interesting because I've always been rather skeptical of neck creams, thinking, you know, this is just a bit of marketing smoke and mirrors. But are you saying that actually physiologically we do have different skin needs between the face and the neck? Well, and if you think about it, the neck is so different. You know, you don't often see pimples or acne on the actual neck itself. I mean, it can happen, but it's True. rare. And yet our neck also often gets very blotchy. Mm -hmm. If one gets embarrassed or gets a little stressed or scratches your neck, you'll see a blotchy. There's a, there are a lot of histamine releases on the neck. So many neck creams will have fragrance because women tend to want something experiential on their neck, right? Mm -hmm. So we very carefully formulated our neck cream as all of our products, but without fragrance because of it, fragrance can cause a histamine release, that blotchiness. Right. So yes, indeed, the, the skin on the neck, the most vertical part of our body, um, is important to stimulate elastin there because uh, verticality is such a challenge for the neck, but also to keep down histamine release and to dial up moisturization because you're, it's not as blemish prone. Yeah, that is so fascinating. It really is. I, I love coming at, at skincare from a clinical evidence-based background. You know, I, it's so refreshing and so unusual to, to hear that. What else can we do to support our own hormone and skin health? Do you, in, in your clinic, do you look at diet? Are there any particular supplements that you recommend? One of the supplements that I, that I really stress, and I think 
it's well known now and understood. And I think COVID's also brought this attention. But when you think about, let's think about ourselves like powered, powered by, I like to say our adrenal glands are batteries, right? And Mm -hmm. our adrenal plans sort of age with time, but yet they're sort of like important to give us that energizer bunny feel. But basically we are solar powered, right? Because our plants, the, the, the main sustenance for, for us and our diet are solar powered. I know what well, you're going to say. I love that analogy. Yeah, this is so great that we're solar powered. <laughs> Come we're on. <laughs> solar powered, and the assumption is that from that solar power, that we will be working not by electricity, but by the light of the day, so that we will get plenty of vitamin D. Yeah, and yep. It, and now that we've moved indoors, especially with COVID and whatnot, we're all vitamin vitamin D deficient. Yeah. And what's even more startling is if you look at the at, at the molecule of vitamin D, it's dramatically similar to estrogen. Is it and really? even more, yes, and even more stunning is that where the receptors are for vitamin D, in the skeleton, in the skin, you know, you think about bones, right? You think about skin for vitamin D, yeah. the, the receptors are also many of the places where estrogen is. So it's absolutely imperative for skin and bone, our connective tissue and our mood, right? Like yes. estrogen to keep vitamin D optimized. I like to aim for between at least 30 up to 70 in a blood level of vitamin D. So I recommend it every day for every patient. So h- how much is that in, in, in a supplement? What are we looking at in terms of? At least at least a thousand international units a day and, and ask for your D level to be drawn. If it's not optimal, 2000 is generally not a problem. Whatever it takes to keep that level between 30 and 70. Mm-hmm. And right. I really think it's important to check. I, I, in the States, it's not yet recommended to check globally. So I don't insist. And some of my patients have to pay out of pocket. It's expensive. Yeah. Blood test in the States. I don't know about in the UK. But I, I do encourage every woman to, to be aware of her vitamin D is adequate because it's so imp- imperative. And then back to what I mentioned about batteries. So the adrenal glands tend to run very much on vitamin C. And vitamin C in a great balanced diet, which is, uh, you know, so important as we know we are what we eat, but it's not hard in the developed world to get adequate vitamin C in a balanced diet. But why take a chance? I I typically just say for optimal skin, go ahead and take 100 milligrams of vitamin C a day. Mm. It doesn't just help the skin. It actually can facilitate the adrenal glands. So it's an amazingly important, very simple vitamin. And then one other, just to mention, because it's so important for heart health, and our heart health is influenced by the biological clock of our ovaries, and that's folic acid. Many of us do not process this B vitamin well. It's common to have a a deficiency in our our chromosomes with processing. So 400 to 800 micrograms a day for metabolism optimization. That's so fascinating because here in the UK, folic acid really has a reputation of being taken preconceptual care you know it's to do with fertility and preventing neural tube defects in pregnancy we don't really hear about it as being such an important nutrient to take certainly as we age well i think you know we are advantaged as obstetrician gynecologists because what's important for fertility is so important for overall vitality remember the number one directive after birth is reproduction for mother nature. Let's don't kid ourselves. So most of the things that are vitally important to avoid during pregnancy and vitally important to increase um, during pregnancy are also vital for optimal vitality throughout a lifetime. Mm. I'm just think about lead exposure and even Zika virus. The more we understand about inflammation and about toxins, we talk about these things during pregnancy because we're so aware of the effects on the fetus. But avoiding lead for a woman's life and a man's life, for that matter, and avoiding inflammation and inflammatory viruses for for your life is also super important. So we can take lessons from obstetrics, such as genetics and influences there and expound on that. That's why I think an OBGYN has a unique opportunity looking at functional wellness to help women and men understand how to stay optimized their entire life. 
it honestly rebecca i could talk to you forever i think this is just so fascinating and the the slant that and the angle that you come from as an obstetrician gynecologist and how that relates to all of us as we age throughout life and the different perspective and the areas of knowledge is just fascinating Thank you so much for you've shared so much, and, and, and I, th I know my listeners will find that incredibly thought provoking. Well, I hope so, and it's always such a great pleasure to talk to you because you are are so driven by this mission, and and again, I feel like there are just a few of us who who just won't stop, and as long as we're alive, <laughs> to be able to try to deliver that understanding, because I do believe that it's women who need are needed desperately to save the planet. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, you. sister, I am right with you, and I think you know, for me, my my you know, I guess my mission statement, if if I had one here at Lizard Wellbeing is to help midlife women and, and to help ensure that the second half of our lives are even better uh, and healthier and have more vitality than the first. And clearly looking after our skin is, is going to be a fundamental part of that. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us. And I so look forward to coming and seeing you and being in your clinic. I, I would so love that when, when all these restrictions are lifted. Absolutely. You must come. I would love to take you on a tour. You you would be very proud of what we've been able to do over here um, at Women First and also to be able to share our products with you because I do feel like they're a vehicle for a, for a very important message. So yeah. thanks so much, Liz. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Stay well. Bye bye now. Now, this episode is not sponsored by Benefect, but I'm pleased to say that Rebecca and her team have kindly put together a very special offer for our listeners here. There are 100 sets of the Luminosity Duo, that's the best-selling anti-aging intensive moisturizer and firming phytolith serum, available with a huge saving of 38% off and free UK postage and packing using the code Liz Loves or in capitals. And that knocks the price down from $380 to $236. That's approximately £181 at the time of recording. Now move fast. They are expensive, but there are only 100 sets available at this lower price. And if you've got your eye on another Venefect product, you can enjoy 20% off the entire range using the code LizLoves, but international shipping rates will apply. So to redeem either offer, head to venefect.com and use the code LizLoves at checkout. That's all in capitals. Now, as always, you will find all the links and the resources mentioned on today's show over on lizardwellbeing.com. There you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter. It's packed with wellbeing wisdom and skin saving tips. Huge thanks to all of you who have left such lovely reviews, especially on iTunes. It really does help others to find the show. So until the next time, go well. Bye bye. Lizar Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earl, with production by Amaryllis Earl and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue, with thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.